Hello from Washington and welcome to Down Ballot Counts, Bloomberg government's weekly podcast tracking the 2020 fight for control of Congress. I'm Kyle Trigstad, politics editor at Bloomberg government. With me as always is Greg Giroux, senior reporter at Bloomberg government. We have got a big show for you today. We're recording this early Tuesday afternoon, several hours before President Trump delivers the State of the Union address. And with the Iowa caucus results still not in. Boy, what a night that was. We'll be focusing on some other big political news on this show. Joining us today to discuss the latest fundraising figures is Congresswoman Sherry Bustos, the chairwoman of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, the official arm of the party dedicated to winning House seats. With so many questions about who will win the White House and the Senate, we'll ask her just how confident the party is feeling about keeping its hold on the House. Before we get to that, we'll break down the big drama in Georgia and spotlight a campaign ad that caught our attention this week. But we'll start the show once again with Greg's number of the week. We were there with 99% of the precincts counted. Number of other key down ballot races. This is a very dramatic turn. We will have to look. House will be in order. Chair requests that members clear the aisle, take seats, cease audible conversation. From Washington, this is Bloomberg Government's Down Ballot Counts. Okay, it's time for this week's Jero's Gem. Greg, what do you got? Thank you, Kyle. Jero's Gem, my number of the week is 89. That's the number of U.S. senators who are of the same political party as the 2016 presidential nominee who carried their state. To put that a different way, Kyle, the overwhelming majority of Republican senators, 51 out of 53 in the current 116th Congress, are from states that President Trump won in the 2016 election, and an almost equally robust supermajority of Democratic senators, 38 out of 47, are from states Trump lost in the 2016 election. Now, this number, 89, is an extraordinarily high number historically. It really underscores how politics have become more nationalized. We have a lot less ticket splitting and more straight ticket voting as the results of Senate elections and presidential elections are moving more in partisan tandem. I think it also explains why we have a lot of party line votes in the Senate as there is little to no political incentive for uh, senators to senators from states that uh, oppose President Trump to join him on major legislation or political incentive for Republican senators from states that Trump carried to oppose him. So that's Jerome's Jim, 89. Yep. And that number has got to make Mitch McConnell feel pretty good. The majority leader in the Senate, only two of his senators are in states that Hillary Clinton carried. And uh, with a three seat uh, margin in the Senate, things are looking pretty, pretty good for him if that trend holds. That's right. In the 2020 election, uh, Democrats will need a net gain of three or four seats to win a majority, depending on the outcome of the presidential election. Republicans have a lot more seats to defend than the Democrats, but many of the Republican seats are in states that voted strongly for President Trump in 2016. All right. Speaking of the Senate majority fight up next, we'll discuss the recent developments that have made Georgia even more interesting than it already was. This is Bloomberg Government's Down Ballot Counts. The Club for Growth, a conservative group that advocates for lower taxes and spending, dropped its first negative TV ad on Monday against Georgia Congressman Doug Collins, the top Republican on the House Judiciary Committee and an outspoken Trump defender throughout the impeachment process. He announced last week that he plans to challenge Senator Kelly Leffler, a fellow Republican, in November's special election. The move enraged top Republican strategists who see the potential for significant fallout from this, as well as the club, which has pledged to spend $3 million against him. Greg, what is going on here? Well, Kyle, this is a really interesting race. And first of all, I should say that Georgia is unusual, and that's hosting two Senate races this November. You have the regularly scheduled election for the seat that um, Republican Senator David Perdue is defending. But then you have this special election where, interestingly enough, uh, all candidates of all parties are going to run on a single ballot in November. Now, Congressman Doug Collins, as you mentioned, is challenging a senator from the same party, Kelly Leffler, who was just appointed to that seat. And Doug Collins has drawn some uh, opposition uh, from the Senate Republican leadership defending uh, Senator Leffler. And Club for Growth, as you mentioned, an activist conservative group that supports spending cuts, tax cuts, uh, free trade, is um, spending money against Collins, which is interesting in part because Kelly Leffler has plenty of money of her own to defend herself. She's committed to spend about $20 million of her money. I looked at this ad from the Club for Growth, and they're attacking Collins for voting for some bipartisan budget agreements, the Farm Bill, things like that. 
that, you know, major pieces of legislation that received overwhelming majorities, including from uh, most, if not all, of the Republican leadership, but was opposed by a lot of fiscal conservatives. And the Club for Growth is a group that has butted, head, butted heads, excuse me, with the Republican leadership on fiscal policy. Yeah. And Collins is someone who's been on Fox News a lot lately, uh, defending Trump on impeachment. Uh, he, he's showing up all the time. And that's where a lot of the Republican primary electorate is getting their news. So that's so a lot of them may assume that he is the conservative in the race. And so I think what the Club for Growth is going to try to do and some other Leffler backers and even Leffler herself, who's also on TV right now, um, is to uh, display her conservative bona fides and why she is actually the conservative candidate in this race, not Collins. Um, we'll, we'll see if it works. That's right. And uh, Leffler has run uh, very closely aligned with uh, President Trump in her short tenure in office. And of course, Doug Collins has a very conservative voting record, and he has a, a, a assumed a high profile as a top backer of the president during the uh, impeachment trial and the impeachment proceeding. He's the top, uh, Collins is the top Republican on the House Judiciary Committee. So um, we're going to have two very strong Trump allies here. Um, what's interesting about this uh, race is that um, because it's an all-candidate, all-party election, you'll have Democrats running on the same ballot as well. It's highly unlikely that any candidate is going to win the 50 percent plus one needed to win that election outright in November. And under current Georgia election rules, a runoff election would be held, get this, January 5th of 2021. That is actually two days after the Constitution says that uh, the new terms for office begin. So we 11 could have months a, from now. That's right. We could have a quite the scenario where let's say the Senate is 50 to 49 and we're waiting for this Georgia runoff to determine uh, to determine the uh, majority of the Senate. Far-fetched, but um, certainly you can't rule it completely out. No, and, and I'm calling this the ballot royale because all these candidates are coming. They're all going to be on the same ticket, um, and it's going to be uh, pretty awesome as a political junkie to, to see how it all plays out. Um, it's also interesting um, to see the establishment of the GOP really all come out against this guy who is someone Trump really likes. And that's something we don't see a lot of, uh, but it's kind of an interesting dynamic. And Kyle, Georgia is also more politically competitive in a lot of federal elections than uh, than it used to be. In uh, the 2016 election, President Trump carried Georgia by just five percentage points. That's down from an eight-point margin for Mitt Romney in 2012. And while I wouldn't put Georgia in among the most highly competitive Senate races, not in the top five, say, it's a state you really have to watch. And the Democrats have a credible candidate in Raphael Warnock, a, a pastor who just recently announced his candidacy uh, for this seat. He'll be sharing that November ballot with uh, Doug Collins and Kelly Leffler. Is this the year it becomes a legitimate swing state? Well, Democrats have to win something first, uh, but it's definitely worth watching. We'll leave it there because up next is our weekly look at a recent campaign ad that stood out to us. Let's take a listen. Finally, bipartisanship for the betterment of community. A win for Anthony Brindisi as his fourth bill is signed into law by President Trump. Anthony Brindisi secures a win for American manufacturing. The Spoons Act to require the Defense Department to buy a flatware made right here. Legislation by Anthony Brindisi now signed into law, giving veterans additional access to suicide prevention. Anthony Brindisi, putting partisan politics aside to get things done for upstate New York. I'm Anthony Brindisi, and I approve this message. That was an ad from Congressman Anthony Brindisi, a freshman Democrat from New York's 22nd District, which stretches north to south down the center of the state. What caught your eye there? Well, Kyle, I think this is maybe a template for the types of ads that we might see Democrats like Brindisi uh, from districts that President Trump carried in 2016. Uh, we see a lot of Democratic ads uh, attacking or criticizing President Trump. But in this case, Brindisi is playing up his alliances with Trump noting that he had four pieces of legislation signed into law by the president, themes of bipartisanship, creating jobs. Uh, he, he mentions, the ad mentions a flatware company in upstate New York. In the defense policy bill that re recently became law, there's a provision that requires the U.S. military to buy its uh, flatware from this company. So you always want to, if you're, if you're in a, especially in a competitive district, but really any member of Congress, you want to kind of play up your uh, you know, the things you're doing you know, back home in the district to, uh, to aid the economy. Um, talking about veterans issues, that struck out at me as well. Um, this district, uh, New York's 22nd, is a very Republican district. It's the most Republican district uh, held by a Democratic uh, freshman. If you look at the Republican performance for president, Trump won this district by about 15, 16 percentage points. So we can expect more of this from Congressman uh, Brindisi, you know, playing down his own party affiliation while playing up bipartisanship. That's right. And he may uh, end up facing the congresswoman he unseated in 2018, Claudia Tenney. 
Uh, we'll definitely be watching that one closely. And uh, we'll, we'll talk to the person charged with helping the congressman defend that seat right after the break. From Washington, this is Bloomberg Government's Down Ballot Camps. On with us now is Congresswoman Sherry Bustos, who's represented Illinois' 17th district since 2013. And this election cycle is charged with defending the Democrats' House majority as head of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. Chairwoman Bustos, thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. When you took over the committee in late 2018, just after winning back the House majority for the first time since losing it in 2010, you faced the prospect of helping reelect a ton of freshman members. And at the time... Uh, 31 incumbents representing a district Trump carried in 2016, yours being one of those, I might add. Um, A little more than a year later, how are you feeling about your chances to keep control of the House? Well, I I feel great. We just got done with the Super Bowl uh, this past weekend, and we can look through it maybe through a sports lens in that uh, this, this past year, the the off year, we did all of the training we needed to do. We are in tip top shape. And uh, we are heading into the 2020 cycle here with uh, having all of our fundamentals down. And um, no, I, I, I think we're in very good shape. We, we did go into the cycle with uh, what we call a, a, a big class of frontliners. And, and being a frontliner just means that you were in uh, some of the tougher districts in the country. But, um, you know, if you, if you want to get into fundraising for a second, which is, you know, that, that's the fuel uh, that we need to, to make sure that we... Uh, we can take off and, and we can get through the finish line. Um, we are we are well fueled. Uh, those frontliners uh, raised ninety three million dollars themselves just last year alone. Um, on top of that, here at the Democratic Congressional Cam- Campaign Committee, we raised an additional one hundred and twenty five million dollars. Uh, so uh, all of these are record breaking numbers, and uh, I, I expect that here now that we're. Uh, one month into 2020, we're going to be in good shape to, to make sure we have that fuel to, to finish in, in the shape we want want to. That's right. And, and uh, Friday's uh, year end filing deadline um, really did display not only how well Democrats are doing, but how much better you're doing than Republicans, um, both with the campaign arms, but also incumbents versus GOP challengers. We talk a lot about how important the money is, but, but what specifically are you using that money for? Well, um, we're using it to, to get people on the ground earlier than we ever have in, in our past. We started putting uh, f- people working in the field all over the country clear back to March of last year. Um, we are uh, in the middle right now. We just made a $1 million ad buy uh, to make sure that people all over the country understand that the Democrats are doing what we promised to do. Um, among those things, uh, we passed momentous legislation to bring down the cost of prescription drugs. Um, and we are pointing out to everybody who will have an opportunity to see that, that while we're getting our job done, you've got Mitch McConnell on the Senate side uh, sitting on uh, more than 275 bills, bipartisan bills, that we sent to his desk and he's doing nothing with them. Um, so we're, we're gearing up um, in a way that we are engaging with voters. Um, we've got a, a program that we call the cycle of engagement. And uh, just for, for qu- a quick explanation of that, um, under Ben Ray Lujan's leadership of the last uh, uh, session, um, he's a member of Congress from New Mexico and was chair of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee going into the 18 cycle. Uh, he, he started something called the year of engagement, meaning they were going to take, uh, we as Democrats were going to take that last year or the on year of the election and make sure that we were fully engaging with voters. Well, we changed that to the cycle of engagement uh, this time around uh, with the belief that you've got to talk to voters, you've got to listen to voter, you've, uh, voters, you've got to engage with voters literally um, all cycle long. So those are just some of the things that we're, um, that we're using those, um, those hard-earned resources that, that our, our donors have been kind enough to, to help us uh, to send our way. There are now about 29 Democrats seeking re-election from districts that the president carried in 2016. And while we don't know how many of those districts will vote for Trump again, even if most or all of them do, what should voters who prefer a second term for the president, why should they split their tickets and reelect a Democrat to the House? 
Well, I, I think that uh, those members of Congress, many of whom are freshmen who have been here for, you know, just uh, about celebrating their one year anniversary as members of Congress, um, they, they're doing everything right. Um, we already mentioned the resources that they'll have to uh, let voters at home know what they're doing, but um, I don't think voters even have to look that far to see what they're doing. They are going home um, when they're not out here in Washington in session. Uh, they are running their offices like they are mayors of a of a town of about 700,000 people. Uh, they're running their campaigns like they're running for mayor. And, and what I mean by that, uh, they are um, every issue that they are aware of, they're trying to do something about. You know, you, you can look at someone like Joe Cunningham, a freshman member from South Carolina who has closed more than 1,500 cases for, for people back home, meaning you know, these are veterans and seniors and, and people who need help with Medicare or Social Security, and he's closed more than 1,500 cases. That's unbelievable for a veteran member of Congress, let alone a freshman. Or you've got Cindy Axney, who is, goes to all of her counties in her district in central uh, Iowa. Um, every, single, every single month, she's going to all of those counties and has held uh, 57 town hall meetings. So... Um, they're doing they're doing what they need to do to make sure they're listening with, to voters and and then they take what they learn from voters and come back out to Washington and get the job done, and uh, you know by sponsoring legislation, passing legislation, and and even being freshman members of Congress, having legislation signed into law like Lauren Underwood, uh, a, a former nurse, now a member of Congress out of my home state of Illinois, who's passed legislation to help bring down the cost of insulin for for people all over the country. You mentioned uh, Joe Cunningham in South Carolina. That was one of the the bigger surprises of 2018. I, I, I'd say the other two were probably in Oklahoma City and Staten Island, New York. Which of those concerns you the most? Well, it, so you're talking about Max Rose and Kendra Horn. Right. Max Rose out of Staten Island, Kendra Horn out of Oklahoma, That's and of course uh, Joe Cunningham that you just mentioned out of South Carolina. Um, I, I don't want to say that I'm worried the most about any of the three. Um, they're all in tough districts. I think we can all acknowledge that. But, but again, when you have the resources to let people know what you're doing and when you are doing the right thing, all three of those uh, brand new members of Congress are just terrific new members. And, you know, I'm, I'm only in my fourth term, so I don't consider myself somebody who, who knows all of the ins and outs of Washington, D.C. by any means. But what I do know is uh, these, these freshman members are extraordinary and the three that you just uh, – uh, did a shout out to are are just really su- they're, they're superb as human beings and they're um, they, they sure act like they've been around Washington um, as far as their uh, getting the job done longer than just being in office for the past year they're uh, they're really doing a good job and again when we when we talk about uh, their their resources let's let's look at this um, Max Rose uh, just last quarter. Just, just in a three-month period, raised $1.2 million. Uh, Joe Cunningham raised $905,000, and Kendra Horn raised $801,000. Those are numbers that in the past were just unheard of. And, and that doesn't happen by mistake. It means that they've got people who believe in them and want to make sure that they're, uh, they return uh, after this election in 2020. Why do House Democrats deserve another term in the majority? Oh wow! You, you can you can just take a look at part of what I just referenced—the 275 bipartisan bills that we've passed and sent over to the Senate. Um, that doesn't mention um, in all we've passed just in 2019 uh, more than 400 bills. But you know, we we made pledges uh, to do three things in particular. It was our it was our main agenda when we went into 2018, and we called it our For the People agenda. Uh, and, and so those three things were uh, passing legislation to bring down the cost of uh, prescription drug prices, uh, pa- uh, looking at uh, rebuilding our country through a robust infrastructure package, which, by the way, we rolled out last week, and we will begin negotiating here this week. Um, it's um, it's a, uh, almost an $800 billion infrastructure package um, over the next five years. Um, and then lastly, that we would do what we could to help clean up just the dysfunction in Washington. It was one of the bills we passed earlier last year. We named it HR1, our For the People Act, which addresses things like money and politics and 
um, making sure that the president of the United States or the those running for president show us their income tax returns and uh, j- just common sense uh, uh, measures to make sure Washington works in a more functional way. And then I think lastly, just really worth, worth mentioning is, is Democrats are literally the only firewall against Mitch McConnell and Washington Republicans' reckless agenda that really puts things like drug manufacturers and their special interest donors ahead of uh, everyday Americans. So, you know, I, I think it's all of that combined, and I think we have a good story to tell uh, people in, throughout our country. Okay, well, we'll have to leave it there for now. DCCC Chairwoman Sherry Bustos, we really appreciate you joining us, and we hope to have you back on as the election year progresses. I would be happy to do that. Thanks, Greg, and thanks, Kyle. really appreciate the time. All right, thank you. And you can follow her on Twitter, at Sherry Bustos, and the DCCC is on Twitter, at DCCC. This is Down Ballot Counts. It's trivia time on Down Ballot Counts. Each week, I'll try to stump Kyle and you, the listeners, with a political trivia question. But before I ask this week's question, let's review last week's question. And Kyle, I asked, who was president of the United States the last time a Democrat won a U.S. Senate seat in Kansas? Uh, Kyle, you have anything for me? All right. Well, this was kind of a trick question for me. I don't think it was meant to be a trick question, but I'm pretty sure the year was 1932 um, and FDR was elected. But Hoover was actually president the last time the election happened. Ding, ding, ding. You are correct. And you did not fall for that little trap I laid for you. It was 1932. (laughs) And in fact, it was uh, Hoover's unpopularity that certainly helped uh, a Democrat win that Senate seat. Democrat George McGill, for those of you keeping score at home, he was reelected to a full term in 1932. But Republicans have won every Senate election since. And uh, they're hoping to uh, continue that streak in the 2020 election. But we're watching that Kansas race because um, you have... You know, Republican Senator Pat Roberts retiring. So good job, Kyle, and good job, listeners, who got that right. Now for this week's question, how many U.S. senators seeking re-election this year represent states that were won by the opposite party's presidential nominee in 2016? So once again, to rephrase that, um, look at the Republican senators seeking re-election from states that Hillary Clinton won in 2016, and then add the Democratic senators you can think of seeking re-election from states that President Trump won in 2016. I want to know the number, and for extra credit, you can name uh, all of the states if you wish. So that's this week's trivia question. Uh, Kyle, you're on the hot seat. I'll give you some time to think about that along with our listeners, but um, we'll have the answer for that next week. You can email your answers to that question to bgovpodcast at bgov.com. That's bgovpodcast at bgov.com. Or you can tweet the answer to the Bloomberg government Twitter handle at bgov and use the hashtag downballotpod. Uh, Answers need not be in the form of a question. We'll reveal the answer and ask a new question on next week's program. That's it for us today. You can follow us on Twitter at Kyle Trigstad and at Greg Giroux. And be sure to check out all the great politics coverage on Bloomberg Government's website, about.bgov.com. We'll talk to you next week. You probably have a lot of questions about the environment. Well, so do we. Are we talking like radioactive chemicals? Is this becoming sort of irrelevant if the U.S. doesn't participate in this? What's going on here? How far did the Trump administration go? And Is mining really better down where it's wetter? Climate change, chemicals, water pollution, you name it. If it's in the environment, we're talking about it. Listen to Bloomberg Environment's official podcast, Parts Per Billion, wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, get up-to-the-minute reporting at our website, news.bloombergenvironment.com.